Good morning, church, and a very happy Sabbath. The song I'm singing today is in Hindi. Um, it's basically a promise from God um, saying that he is with us. Don't let the, the sadness of this world scare you. Don't be scared because very soon he is going to come and take us home. I'm 
Good morning and a blessed Sabbath to everyone in the sanctuary and to all that are joining us in worshiping our Lord and Creator from any location in the country, around the world, wherever you may be, as we study God's Word together, we seek that He will continue to bless us and use us in whatever capacity He chooses. Um, just have a word of prayer, mighty God, as we come together to praise you and honor you and to worship you and study from your word. Heavenly Father, may we be more enlightened, may we be more committed in serving you and hastening your soon return. In your son's name I pray. Amen. My name is Maxwell Paul and this week we have a panel of Bible leader me, Amar, <coughs> Vijay, Mike, and Sham, who will be leading out in different days, and they will introduce themselves in person when they uh, when they come and talk about their day's lesson. We are so fortunate to be able to come into the house of worship and study from God's word. Just to remind ourselves that not that you already don't know, we. Sabbath school is a place of not preaching. It's a place of interactive study. And in fact, we have been admonished by our Sabbath school superintendent to spend less time in speaking and more time in questioning. And as much as possible, we will try to honor the directions that uh, has been given to us from the Sabbath school leader. As you all know, we have been studying this quarter, managing for the master. Now, all of us realize and understand what the meaning of that word is. At times, we may not be taking that literally or even in a serious thought. But I want to remind myself and everyone else that it is real. We indeed are managing for the master. Come the pen of inspiration and the scriptures admonish us and direct us and has recorded for posterity that we are only his stewards. Ownership does not belong to us. He is the one who has given us the ability to go out labor, make a living, and in his divine providence, whatever comes our way belongs to him. We are just his stewards. We should never forget that concept. And in that context, it's managing for the master. We all need to realize that all the blessings we enjoy are only possible because he makes it possible. Not that I or you or anyone can go out in our own strength, in our own power and do and accomplish. The more we are on our knees, the more we stay committed to the admonition that comes from the word of God, will we be blessed Amen. in every experience of life we have to learn to depend on him and him alone, who is the source and inspiration Amen. of life, of the blessings of life, and we need to continue praising him, and whether it's a mountaintop experience or a valley experience. Having said that, today's topic is dealing with debt. It's kind of a very touchy subject, and I'm going to try to, as best as, get into it without. Uh, and none of us should feel it in a personal sense that whatever is, and for that reason, I decided I didn't write any notes. I said, I'm going to use just the words of the author. We're going to read, and I don't want to say anything out from my interpretation of it, but nevertheless, 
those of us that have gone through the lesson, it's a beautiful lesson. If we follow the rigors of this week and the preceding weeks and the succeeding weeks, we will certainly be blessed in caring and dealing and managing for the master in majority of us in our lives at one stage or the other have experienced, have encountered those issues. And the scriptures tell us that, like in the memory verse, Proverbs 22, 7, that borrower is a slave to a lender. Now, that word kind of seems a little bit hard to me, but maybe back in those days, it literally was as times have evolved, it may have a little less impact than what it did in those times because in today's world, you cannot live a life without borrowing. So what do you do? Uh, you may have millions of dollars sitting in, in your account, but if you don't have the ability to be able to borrow, you cannot grow. Your growth depends on your credit worthiness and how you establish your credit worthiness is just by borrowing. But in a responsible manner, make sure payments are returned in time as agreed. That's what establishes. Number two that I think is important, like I just mentioned, that at times it's very necessary. But the most important aspect is that we can be debt free. We can be debt free. It requires planning, but we leave that for the last day, Friday's lesson, and also where we will interact with each other in that. Proverbs 11.24, I don't think it's in the lesson study, but I, I think it's a very interesting verse. When we talk of stewardship, there is no way, at least I can ignore that verse. That verse, just like we know, like a farmer plants a seed, it grows many fold. By our generosity, and helping out, you grow and the Lord blesses you. The scriptures admonish us that our brothers and sisters who are in need, we have to be able to help. We've got to be able to, but doesn't mean that you need to be taken advantage of. You have to be responsible in everything that we do. Sunday's lesson brings us to the debt problems and the author lists three things. One is ignorance, second is financial difficulty or greed, and the third is some unforeseen reason. Number one and two, the author uses the word illiterate. I'd like to substitute that with uneducated because there's a distinction between illiterate and uneducated. So in that third word, first and the third is now, but the second is most important about the greed. In all that we do, we need to remember that we need to stay humble. Just because God has blessed us doesn't mean that everything is mine. It is not mine, we remind ourselves. It's his, I am his manager just like it says, managing for the master. The day will come, he'll ask. And as we continue studying, there's so much to talk, so much, but you know, time is so short. So we'll try to move on into the next. My name is Amar, and I'm doing Monday's portion, following godly counsel. Mark 10, 25 says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. You know, Jerusalem is a walled city, and we know this very well. 
uh, after Babylonians destroyed, take the, taken the, all these people into captivity. After uh, Darius got this uh, uh, suggestion, he sent people and they went and built, rebuilt walls. So Jerusalem is really a well-built walled city. Nobody could enter in once the gates were closed. But then Friday comes, the gates are closed because Sabbath. Nobody can go in and come into the city. But there were people, merchants, who were taking their camels and the trade was all done on camel backs, right? Lots of goods on camel backs and they would come late. How would they enter into the gate? Gate is closed. For them, they made a provision, a small gate. It's like a needle, that's why this, it says that. Uh, they had to strip all the goods and then really literally get the camel on its knees through that needle. So difficult. That is why it says. Now coming to the title, following godly counsel. What is godly counsel and who needs it when in difficulties, financial crisis, foreclosures or credit card debts or natural disaster strike, people tend to make debts. And eventually they go to friends, family, pastors, counselors, and various people to get this counsel. But is that really God's good counsel? Is it godly counsel? No. Godly counsel only comes from Bible and Bible alone. Proverbs 19, 20 and 21 says, Hear counsel, receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in later end. There are many devices in man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord will stand, it says. The best and the genuine is godly counsel. So seek God always. Matthew 6, 24 says, No man can serve two masters for either he will hate one and love the other, else he will hold to one. Now here mammon means money, wealth, and things like that, where we put our context in. So, uh, and also John 1, 2, 5 says, Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. Both these texts are saying the same thing. Uh, where you put your priority, that's what it really talks about. If you have, uh, you, you go into a room and switch on the light, uh, the power. What happens? Light comes on and darkness dis is dispelled. You switch it off, darkness comes. Both cannot exist together. So if you love God and money, I mean, if you love God, money doesn't become your master. It's like this. Fire is a good servant and a bad master. You use fire wisely for cooking, heating and all. It's like a servant. But bad master ruins and kills. And another thing, now coming to vows, Psalms 50, 14 says, Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay your vows. And it is better you don't make a vow, but if you make a vow, make sure you attend to that and pay your vows. Now, Ecclesiastes 5, 4 and 5 says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, differ not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldst not vow. Do not play with God. Technically, we all are in debt because everything we see around is God's. And everything that we have is God's gift. So we need to wisely manage, as Mr. Max said. And all things are made by him. And without him was nothing that was made. You know, you read John 1, 1 to 3, you understand that. Pe poor people or unwealthy people, they can extremely have love for the world. And wealthy people don't have to have that kind of uh, love for the world. They can be like Abraham. He saw the city just like Lot, but he didn't choose it. So we need to have our priorities set. Now, is money more valuable than contentment? First Timothy 6, 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great. This is what we need to strive for. And First Timothy 6, 7 to, uh, 7 to 10, we says, for we were bought with, uh, we are brought into this world with nothing. And certainly we will go with nothing. And if you go, you will understand more. So, Peace, love, 
contentment is what we need to have our priorities set on. You can have money. Money is money a problem? Money is not a problem. Money is good. It serves us. We can buy things. Uh, here is a text I want to read actually. I just lost that one. Money brings value. We can use it. And we can also at the same time glorify God with it. Be wise in doing this. Following godly counsel. Thank you. We have heard from Elder Maxwell and Amar reasons why people get into debt. My name is Vijay David and uh, I'll be doing the Tuesday's lesson and the title of the lesson is How to Get Out of Debt. So we'll discuss and see how we can get out of the debt that people get into. It's not God's plan for us to be in debt. Living in debt is a bad way of living. And there are three reasons three kinds of debts that people get into. And most of, most of the people are either involved in one or all of the debts. So the three kinds of debts are necessary debts. What kind of debt falls in under this category, necessary debt? Mortgage. It's the top of the list of all the debts. You know, everyone, we need roof over our heads so we buy a home so you need to borrow money you know so you need to pay mortgage so that's the top list of the uh, debt mortgage next comes we need to commute to our jobs to our shopping we need car so that's another debt that people have and the third kind of debt is reckless spending debt. People who want instant gratification. You know, what, when they see something, they want to have it. Greediness. So these are the three kinds of debts that people uh, fall, uh, are in, you know. And there are three ways to get out of debt. The Bible, uh, the lesson study explains these three kinds of debts that uh, you can uh, get out of. Number one, reduce or stop credit spending. Reduce or stop credit spending. When you don't borrow money, you don't get into debt. That's simple. When you don't borrow money, you don't, you don't get into debt. Second, make a covenant with God that you will pay off your debt as quickly as possible. God is eager to bless every one of us. You know, he has so much of blessings that he wants to shower upon each one of us. And God blesses, when God blesses you financially, or when you get a stimulus check from a government, most people since this is an extra money they got, they go, they go out, do their shopping. But lesson tells us that we need to use this money towards paying the principal, either car loan or a mortgage. Pay towards the principal. That way you'll reduce the debt. Use that uh, extra money that you get to pay off your debt, not to purchase more things. This step is probably the most crucial. Don't spend this money, but instead apply towards the, your debt reduction plan. And number three, make a list of all your debts, starting from the lowest to the highest. Of course, as I said, mortgage 
comes on the top of the list. So the lesson tells us to get rid of the lowest debt. It could be a store credit card. You know, when you buy something, you, you know, that comes on your uh, bill, try to pay it off. Not just pay the minimum, just pay a little more so that you can knock off the, the lowest debt. So once you knock off the lowest debt, go to the next higher um, uh, debt and then try to clear that off. So this way you can clear all your debts because it's not God's plan for us to be in debt. So we need to try to get out of debt. God wants us to bless. God wants us to be blessed so that we, we don't have to be in debt so we can help others instead. There are a few more tips I, can, I want to give you. If you, if you want to come out of debt, make a covenant with God that you'll be faithful and trust His will, His word, His promises. If you want to uh, get out of debt, pay your tithes and offerings. That's very important. God will bless you when you pay your tithes. When you don't give your tithe, you're missing out on His blessings. We all need to practice proper money management and follow the principles of God. God's word and he will bless you tremendously beyond what you can imagine. It might take a little hard work, a prayer, or a dedication. Learn to be content with what you have. I know a person, um, when he visits your home, he will see something, uh, a decorative piece or something beautiful, a beautiful furniture in your home and he likes it. The next thing, you can see that same thing in his house, or even better one. So that's greediness. So you don't have to be that greedy. Learn to be content with what you have. We need to change our lifestyle, our habits, or even our circumstances, like getting a second job. When people have huge debts, they will dig into their savings, and even their retirement, that that's going to hurt you, hurt yourself and your family. So don't try to dig into your savings or retirement. When you do this, you're hurting yourself and your family as well. God will provide you what you need today if you will trust his will, his plan, and his promise. Being in debt is exceedingly cruel. It limits your life. Put limits on yourselves so we can meet our financial goals. But if, if you're in debt, you can't meet those financial goals. And my last tip to get out of debt is to live within your means, spend within your limits. Good morning, happy Sabbath. My name is Michael Benazay. Wednesday's lesson is titled, Surety and Get Rich Quick Schemes. Two very unique ways of getting oneself in the trouble. My four takeaways from this lesson are as follows. Number one, becoming a co-signer for someone else, even a loved one, can be very unwise unless you are able to assume the debt. The research has shown that three out of four people end up making the payments for that individual with poor credit. Second, we mustn't mistake this for showing love towards someone who is in need. We have to be willing to stand up for our belief in Jesus Christ and offer sound advice to others regardless of the relationship. Third, lusting for money is another very foolish mistake and exactly the opposite of what we need to be doing in the last days here on earth. And last, deception. You see, I can make myself believe that I know what is good for me and yet completely ignore the counsel that is given me daily from my heavenly father. And then this verse popped into my head, be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
Galatians 6, 7. So I've prepared a few questions for all of you, and I would very much appreciate um, some participation here. My first question is this. When it comes to surety, what happens when the person that we have co-signed for begins to default on their payments? Anyone? You're responsible. You're responsible, so you need to make those payments. Right. The person who signs off for the other person with the bad credit or no credit at all, they default on those payments, and then who does, who, who does the um, bank come after? Full exactly. When I was 18, I wanted to get a car. I had a job, but I didn't have any credit. So my mother co-signed for me. You know, so it's a very big responsibility. Um, not something to be taken lightly, for sure. My second question is this. The Holy Bible provides sound doctrine against being a co-signer for someone else. So my question is, why? Does it make a difference sufficient enough for someone to do it for a family member? Should it matter? In the lesson it said that we, we shouldn't do it for anybody, right? It could be your son, your daughter, an aunt, an uncle, it doesn't matter. Is there a reason sufficient enough to do it for someone? Okay, that's, that's a good response, but. You see, loving somebody is, is different from enabling somebody. If you love somebody, you're gonna give them what they need but if you enable somebody, they're never gonna have what they need to make it on their own. So that's a very, very fine line. My third question, you know, when we talk about the get rich quick schemes in life, they come in all shapes and sizes. Choose your poison, or as Jacob Wade would say, which one are you gonna smoke? Why should we avoid gambling or placing bets on any platform, whether it's legal or not? Does the, does the Bible say anything about gambling? Does the Bible say we shouldn't uh, place bets? Not specifically, but if you go to the Adventist.org website, you can read uh, about our beliefs and how we feel about gambling. So it's, it's not a, a very wise practice. In fact, this isn't in the lesson, but in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 11, I'm taking this from the New Living Translation Bible, it says wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Which brings me to my final question. How can someone who knows the scriptures and has a problem of gambling be rehabilitated? Do we give up on that person? You know, um, Alexander Cole had a very powerful message last night. And, um, you know, he, he, he made a point that I can relate to. Um, I, too, have been guilty of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. But I want to say this, Brother Alexander. I'm right there with you. And by God's grace, we will reach the finish line together. And one final thought I would like to leave with all of you. This turns out to be 
one of my wife's uh, favorite quotes from the pen of inspiration. No man is safe for a day or an hour without prayer. And that comes from Great Controversy, page 530. This week's lesson dealing with debt, and we receive an acronym from Pastor Mike Pedrin. It says, Jews elevated by troubles. Jews elevated, and it's nothing but buying troubles. My name is Sham, and I will be teaching Thursday's lesson entitled Term Limits and Borrowing Points. You see on the TV ads, people asking to receive money, call this number. And also financial institutions, they send us every week, almost every week I receive, you are pre-approved. Term limits and borrowing points. This is a clear difference between the way the world deals with the subject of lending and borrowing and the way the Bible tells us we should behave when we borrow or lend money. God's word sets a much higher standards for us believers, both on lending as well as on borrowing side. Lending, earning interest, on debt and borrowing have been practiced by humankind for ages. And there is no lack of instruction. Helpful tips and teaching around this subject for anyone who is not well versed with God's word, it's easy to fall prey to financial practices that are neither honoring to the Lord nor to the others. Now let's take a closer look at this subject so we can in confidence act when borrowing or lending money. Is debt a sin? What's our responsibility as a borrower? God's word never speaks of debt as a sin, but there are clear references to debt as slavery. Borrowing money is never encouraged in, in the scriptures. And when Moses spoke to the people of Israel, borrowing from others was listed as a consequences of disobedience. So what's the parameters should we live by when borrowing money? Pay back every penny. The Bible is clear that when we do decide to take on debt, we are to pay back whatever we borrow. In Psalm 37, we read, the wicked borrows but does not pay back. However, in Ecclesiastes, it is better that you should not owe than that you should vow and not pay, because God's word gives strict direction to the lenders to extend grace to those who borrow, or those who cannot repay debt. We often treat it as a way out of fulfilling our obligations as a borrower, which is to pay back the debt we took on. The lender's obligations to do do not release us from our responsibility as a borrower. Don't finance your wants with debt. Too many people treat debt as a way to finance their wants and desires. That's plain foolish because of our inability and willingness to say no to stuff. We convince ourselves that we have to have whatever it is and therefore place our families and ourselves in a position of enormous financial stress. Before you borrow money, sit down and make sure you have the financial margin to manage the debt as a part of your monthly cash flow. If you don't, 
Pray and trust God for provision. Give him the chance to act on your behalf instead of immediately reaching for man-made solutions. Now, what's our obligation as a lender? Both the Old and New Testament speak to the subject of lending and address the abuse with lending practices. As believers, we are admonished to lend to those who are in need, to lend to the poor without expecting anything in return. In Luke chapter 6, verse 34, this is what Jesus said, and if you lend to those whom you expect expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. When we lend our monies, our motives should be pure. When those who borrow from us cannot repay, we should release them from the burden of debt and not hold grudge. Yes, that's very hard to do, but God's ways are much different than the world ways. In charging interest, is charging interest wrong? God warns in Exodus 22, 25 says, if you lend money to any of my people with you, who is poor, you should not be like a money lender to him and shall not exact interest for him. There are many references lending without charging interest, especially when we we'll lend to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but what about lending to those who are not part of the body of Christ? It is what we find in Luke 6.35, but love your enemies and do good, and lend, expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful as well as to the evil. The text I, want, I missed I want to say. What does the Bible say about money? Ecclesiastes 10, 19 says, A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, merry, but money answereth all things. So money is good. But what is the problem with money then? 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money, that is the problem. It is the root of all evil. So we have to be wise handling money. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for the good advice and references from the Word of God. And I'm sure that it will find practical application in our lives. Now, kind of some, um, I think the offering would be collected at this time. So, basically what we need to, I go back to a text from the book of Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Learn to trust in God. Submit yourselves to him. At times, as humans, you worry or we worry about our titles, this, that, accomplishments. But we need to remember that we are called the sons and daughters of Christ, of God. There can be no better title than that. That's something we do need to be talking about and telling people uh, about it. And remember, God is the one with the resources, and we need to work with him. We need to be able to manage our finances. And the Lord says, God's counsel to his children, in wise man records for posterity, honor Lord with their possessions, and the first fruits of all your increase. It is so critical that we are committed. Our words aren't enough, means our actions must say what we believe in. In summarizing uh, Fridays and 
looks like we kind of run out of time, so I just say uh, uh, you can read the entire text from Councils of Stewardship, page 257. And the, uh, the pen of inspiration talks about be determined not to incur debt. Make a solemn covenant with God that by his blessings you will pay your debts. And then work them off as fast as possible. All of us can and everyone thinks, acts, works differently. The author says establishing a budget, destroying credit cards and beginning economic measures. Couple of questions I would just like to throw. Means we have heard about debt. How to handle debt? Not getting into debt, not taking those things. One question that's common to us all. You know, when we purchased this church, we had to borrow to buy this church. Was that something that God approves of? I'm just throwing that question. Anybody answer that question? Because that's something, it's not as personal, but it's personal to us as a collective congregation. So, should we, because the scriptures admonish us not to be in debt, should we as a church borrow money to buy a church? Can't we live in a rental place? Yes. Church, not no, personal. No, but I said we don't have the church doesn't have to be. All right, there. so let, let's be specific and stay to that. Last person can have a word on that. Say, there are many questions I had written down, but obviously we don't seem to have any last person. Should a church take debt to purchase property? No. All right. Thank you all, and I wish. As a church, sometime maybe we need to decide to, you know, give more time to Sabbath school discussion, as apart from 40 minutes to maybe a longer period. But that's for the leadership to decide. But thank you all for your participation. May God bless us as we enter into the divine service. Thank you, and God bless you, and have a blessed Sabbath.